So I want to introduce um, Terry Trueblood. Uh, some of you already know him, uh, but if you don't, I will introduce you to him. Uh, him and I met at a conference called the Archives of the Impossible, which was quite an interesting event. <laughs> and uh, Terry and I and two other people ended up spending all of our dinner times together. And I got to know this inc incredible individual. And I'm just delighted to, uh, you know, to welcome him. One of the things that's very, uh, that I like about Terry, I know a fair amount of people in the esoteric world, the psychic world and all that. And a lot of them are what I'm going to call woo-woos. Terry, um, he may have some woo-woo in him, but he's not from woo-woo. <laughs> As he writes on his website, he has a diverse background. He has a 30-year state law enforcement investigator. He's been an emergency medical technician and a leading authority in the dive rescue profession, which means that you go underwater and you rescue people. In fact, in 2010, Terry earned a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Association of Dive Rescue Specialists. When he transitioned, and maybe he'll tell us about that, into being a, uh, I call him a metaphysician, he did a lot of study. He earned the title of Master Hypnotist, Hypnotherapist and Regressionist, he got a, 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 a doctorate or a PhD, I don't remember, in uh, metaphysical research, and um, he's also a Reiki master. And, um, you know, he does everything from ghost, bust, ghost busting to uh, ordinary, he's, he's a minister, also does ordinary counseling for people that are in distress. So it's my great honor uh, to welcome um, my new friend, Terry Trueblood. Thanks, Angela. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I appreciate everybody here today taking time to uh, to listen to whatever group talk we're going to have here and experience. Uh, yeah, Angelo and I met down at Rice University, and uh, he was up on stage as a panelist. And so uh, you have an excellent host here uh, that's uh, well recognized across the United States in order to get up on the panel to begin with. So uh, hats off to Angelo for uh, you know putting this on and, and lifelong experience and in the field. So yeah, this should be fun. And some of you know me, some of you have been in my household actually, and uh, some of you haven't. But uh, if you're ever around uh, Southern Illinois, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, so anyway, uh, yes, my background is diverse, that's for sure. Uh, I teach 48 different kinds of programs, and that's a whole across a very broad spectrum of programs, uh, a lot of which is in the metaphysical world, but many things are not. You know, I've taught everything from you know, pistols and rifles, defensive tactics, DUI investigation, underwater investigation, written a book and advanced underwater crime scene technician stuff. So, uh, and, and it goes on and on and uh, emergency medicine, uh, dive rescue work and still doing that. Matter of fact, I got training tomorrow, commander of a team. I was also chief diver for the state as well until I retired from that and uh, so forth. And then metaphysically, uh, yeah, man, we, we do everything, everything, you know, uh, he, Angelo touched on a few things that I do. Uh, it's quite a bit more. So I look forward to uh, our discussion today. So I'll hand it back to you. What do we want to start with? Um, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a broad open-ended question. Anybody could say anything. And then, okay. uh, or you could put stuff in the chat if you're shy. <laughs> and we'll just go from there. Don't be shy. I've heard it all. Believe me, heard it all. Um, I think we were going to talk about spiritual discernment. And, you know, coming from a background in, in law enforcement, and a lot of things I did were related to consumer fraud. Uh, this is something that in the metaphysical field, it, it's a problem. It's a problem. And uh, people who are just getting into it, starting the what we would typically call the awakening process, can easily get sucked into programs, people that are more money oriented than set for a proper awakening. And I think you've all probably experienced those people who are in it for the bucks and they're not in it for your best and highest good. And they may not be that advanced themselves, but maybe they have the best website or something like that. So I think what we wanted to talk a little bit about is, you know, how do I discern those kinds of things in addition to when I'm receiving things uh, from the other side? How do I discern that it's right, wrong, 
whatever. Uh, so that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and we have many things we can talk about. So if, if you drop off into a different topic, that's fine with me. We'll, we'll eventually make our way back to this. But um, one thing I would say is, as it relates to uh, discernment, people usually call me and they say, hey, I'm going to take this class from so-and-so, or I'm going to take uh, a program. It's a week long and it's $4,000. Is it worth it? Huh. Well, that's a big question. You know, that is a big question. And one that uh, I take real seriously because some programs maybe are, and some programs are not at all. I, I, just the other day, you know, we were talking to um, an individual who went through a Reiki program from knowing nothing, but it, within like a week or less, was all of a sudden a Reiki master. Now, for those of you who've been through Reiki, I don't know, hold your hands up. Anybody been through Reiki? But usually that's kind of a lesser included program these days. But most Reiki masters are going to say you've got a 21 day kind of a detox period before you can even do Reiki too. Some Reiki masters also make sure you do a certain amount of people, friends and family first. And then at Reiki too, you can kind of get out into the public a little more. And then eventually at some point get to Reiki master. But if somebody's processing people through in three days to be a Reiki master from nothing, uh, I think it loses a whole lot in the translation. And it's not so much that uh, I think that uh, you know, they can't learn it, but boy, would they be really ready to teach other people in three days of experience, which is going to be very compact? Uh, probably not. Those are some, some signals, some signs uh, to discern that that may not be in your best interest. You know, they, years ago in the military, uh, they were trying to, you know, make everything a little softer back in the 1980s, right after Vietnam. And uh, one of the things the Marine Corps did was say, this is tough. Only a few people can do this. If you think you can live up to it, that's where, where we're at. They were the only ones that didn't have a, a recruitment problem. Because if you give people a challenge, they usually want to live up to it. And they want to have something that's legit. It's kind of like taking a CPR class. You punch through a CPR class in a half an hour and they hand you a card and you walk out the door. Are you really ready? Or did you need to spend quite a few hours really getting that down so you could actually do the job. So there's a big difference between what I call uh, card collectors or patch collectors uh, in, a, in exchange for somebody who actually is really a legitimate provider. And so I think we need to really take a hard look at some of these programs that are around that may not be in your very best interest. And uh, a little research goes a long way in that respect. So, um, Terry, somebody in the chat says something about um, dreams. Um, yes. uh, maybe he can try and discern someone's dreams or analyze a dream. Absolutely. Literally what's that. So I, I remember you said you said initially you were talking about something maybe experiential around dreams that might do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of different kinds of dream situations, but dreams are typically a way that our subconscious mind talks to ourselves. In other words, we'll use characters. I kind of call it clip art. If you're familiar with computer clip art, everybody has their own computer clip art based on their life experiences, their education, jobs, and family, and so forth. And so from the other side, your subconscious is going to draw from what you know, characters. So your mother's in the dream. Does that mean it's really about your mother? No, it means that's a character in there. You know, a dog is in there. What does that mean? A, a, a alligator is in there. A snake is in there. Uh, rubies and diamonds are in there. Those are things that help us determine what the dream is about. So if somebody has a dream in particular, uh, yeah, by all means, uh, if you feel like you can share it, uh, we will definitely uh, we'll definitely break it down. But as a workshop, so to think, thing, you want to get the basic overview of a dream. What is the context of the dream itself? That's the first thing you have to get down. Uh, say somebody is chasing you or you're chasing someone else. Where is that taking place? Are you on foot? Are you in a car? Are you in a truck? Are you in a tank? Uh, what are you wearing? Uh, who is the other person in relationship to you? Those are some of the basic overview elements you have to get down first. 
And then you want to start to go through what we would consider identifying specific elements within the dream itself. And as you go through the dream itself, we need to know exactly what it was you were doing. And sometimes you know, people say we can't remember our dreams. Well, I would say that you need a dream journal, and a lot of people would say that as well. And you can discern just from writing a few sentences down at 2 o'clock in the morning, it'll be enough to stimulate your memory so you can then recall the dream. And if somebody's actually talking to you, asking specific questions, and keep in mind for me, that was 30 years of experience of interview and interrogation. So getting right to the nub of the issue uh, very quickly helps us in determining what the specific elements of the dream are. Uh, and then we have to take and say, what are the meanings of those elements? So uh, say you had a dream and um, let's use a Christian archetype. Uh, Mother Mary shows up in your dream. What does that really mean? Is that Mother Mary in and of itself? Unlikely, uh, but it is a element that you are looking at an archetypal feminine element to help you discern what's going on within your life. And that character plays that role. Um, likewise, people have the devil show up uh, if, if you follow that belief system. And what does that mean? Those are all things that are important. Certain kinds of clothing that people are wearing can help you understand whether this is a really elegant setting and what does that mean? Or it's a very, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're barely clothed or nude. Uh, that creates another element. For example, people have those uh, naked dreams, so to speak, and people ask me all the time, what does that mean? Well, it typically means you don't have anything to hide in this dream. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything else. Uh, if you're talking about lizards and alligators and sometimes turtles and snakes, a lot of that has a sexual orientation to it and you're trying to deal with an ongoing relationship or partnership, that could very well be part of it. So then once you kind of get the elements down, then there's going to be a message summary that you put together. So putting all that together, what is this dream truly trying to tell me? And that is something that, uh, you know, somebody like me or other dream interpreters could probably help you with. But ultimately, you're going to be the best interpreter of your dream more than anybody else, we'll just help guide you. But the reason certain things come up, only you may know. Uh, we can give you some generalizations, but uh, I would suggest that most people will know themselves better than any other dream interpreter. So Terry, we have a couple of questions uh, okay. in the queue, but um, also, uh, but before we get to that, um, anyway, it seems like we're gonna do questions first and then we'll, we'll do whatever okay. else Terry sure. wants to do. But in any event, um, Ian has a dream he wants you to want some help with. Okay. Okay. Awesome. This is a great opportunity. Um, so when I was young, I would have a reoccurring dream and it would always be around Christmas time where I would be walking down the steps and I would see a robot stealing my Christmas presents. And okay. when I would go to like stop him, he would look at me with like red lasers and then I'd be like paralyzed. And I like couldn't move anymore. And that happened to me like, I don't know, at least like four or five years over until after that, I just like stopped dreaming. And I didn't have another dream for maybe like whew, eight to 10 years. And if there's like any insight, I like, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that in a very long time, but that just kind of came up. And yeah. Well, you know, just, recurring dreams, I assume you've had it since the first time. Oh, I've had it like eight, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then around then I kind of just stopped dreaming. Okay. Well, nobody really stops dreaming. You well, may stop, stop remembering, remembering your dreams. Yes. yes. Uh, but everybody does dream, you know, three or four dreams a night. And, uh, you know, those can be recalled. And sometimes, you know, I, I recall dreams that I had when I was a child. If I want to redream them, I can't. You have great amount of control in those mm. situations. And so we need to think about dreams. There is a thing called uh, dreams. And then there's also visions. And people mix visions and dreams up. What you're describing is a dream. A vision is a little bit different. We'll get into that a little later. And then lucid dreaming is another aspect that a lot of people are probably familiar with, where you're in the dream, you know you're in the dream, and then you can control elements of the dream and how it ends. Uh, 
And so sometimes I tell people that have a very disturbing dream, uh, go back and redream it and end it the way you want it to end. And hmm. you'll have a great opportunity to fix whatever the problem may be. But let's go through yours. It was Christmas time. Christmas is a holiday, right? Christmas is related to family, correct? Yes. Is that true in your household? Uh, okay. for, yeah, for sure. Good. And Christmas also um, says that you're going to have a um, experience of uh, receiving something. Now, when you're a little kid, it's all about receiving. It's not about giving. Okay. And so it's about receiving something. But then you're walking downstairs. So you're going into your lower levels of consciousness. Mm. Okay. Those are deeper thoughts. And what you saw was a robotic situation, which robots run on kind of automatic. They don't have any personality. They don't have any, you know, any uh, humanity to them. And then they are stealing or taking your presence away. Correct? Is that what you Correct. You're, correct me if I'm wrong. What happens after they take them away? Oh, well, they're in the process of taking them. And then I go to try to stop them. Uh -huh. And then they like look at me with like these red laser eyes okay. and then all of a sudden I'm paralyzed and I like can't move. Can't move. And then, and then I kind of like the, then I wake up or I don't okay. remember after that. Okay. So eyes are about judgment. Hmm. Somebody's judging you. This is going to relate back typically to someone in your family that is, has that robotic characteristic. In other words, is willing to take something away from you before you actually get to it is normal. It doesn't necessarily it can be, I always say it's your demigods. Your demigods are mom, dad, aunts, uncles, preachers, teachers, anybody in authority over you or a parent authority over you. An eight-year-old would think had authority over them. So if you think back to who that was that may have had authority over you that would take something away before you got it, or it appeared that they would be able to do that in your regular life, here you go through the situation where you have Christmas. So you're, there's an expectation of receiving. You're going into your lower consciousness, and there is an obstacle. In this case, you created the robot which has no feeling, it's just automatic going to happen. And then they start taking away or not allowing you to have what you think you're supposed to have. Well, let me, uh, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, you just let me realize it's 100% about my dad. Yep. Maybe not 100%. But um, yeah, if I like spent more time telling you about that relationship, I think it would be even more clear. Wow, yeah. that dream was about my dad. That's crazy. It's about uh, your dad and his lack of empathy for you and his oh ability boy. to judge you. And so that's what that was all about. So, all uh, right. Well, uh, yeah, oops, we, we could spend yeah, a lot of time on these dreams. But, uh, you know, tomorrow, no. tomorrow's, tomorrow's got a question. But I, tomorrow, I'm, I'm going to ask you to rephrase it in a way. Because you ask about the difference between something about intuition and how do you make a choice. I wonder if you could make that a little bit more personal. In other words, like talk about an actual situation. So um, it's not an abstract answer you're going to give, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. I was hoping, Ian, can you? More. Yes. I can hear myself twice. Oh, I'm a problem. Thank you. Um, we're in the same area. I was hoping that maybe Terry can um, speak to something from his life. Um, it could be anything like decision making about moving or about a person in your, our lives or a boundary you want to make with a family member or something like this. Mm -hmm. She don't want to talk about herself, but she wants to know how to how she used your <laughs> intuition to make a make a make a um, you know make a choice or something. Uh, well, you know, one of the things I, I'll just go to this and say, you know, I, obviously I I've, I've been fortunate enough to you know develop psychically and as a medium and, 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 and intuition is a little different than that. Um, I always consider intuition something coming from your third chakra. For those of you familiar with the chakra system, you know, running from the root to the crown, they say seven, but there's really 12 and actually more, but that's most people live with seven because uh, they're not even using those. So why talk about 12, you know, 
there we go. But um, the third chakra is kind of your, I call it, it's like a radar wave that goes out. Women are especially good at it. It's like walking into a group and in law enforcement, you certainly walk into groups all the time and there's people that absolutely hate you and you don't even know you. Uh, they want to kill you and you don't even know you, but you have to assess that almost instantaneously or you're dead. It's as simple as that. So you waft that out and women do it. Let's say uh, you walk into a party and this like radar wafts out. And this is your intuition. You're bumping into other people's energy and you're assessing that. You're getting a feedback like radar or sonar and you immediately go, ooh, that guy's a creep. That guy looks okay. This guy, well, I think I could talk to, you know, and these ladies over here look like I could bond with them, but you're, you're wafting into that with the energy. And so you look really quickly into how do I assess this uh, social situation? And then you feel comfortable to go maybe approach somebody because your gut, and that's where we get the gut instinct. And that's actually taught in law enforcement, uh, believe it or not. It's called the sixth sense. Uh, and it's in the academies and I teach them. And um, that is how you do that. Now, as far as me using some of the other skills, uh, when I'm have been looking for people who are underwater that have drowned, and I sometimes get called to those moments, sometimes hundreds of times. But I remember one in particular. I got called to. Uh, they had been looking and looking for days, and I got there and I just tuned into it. I was on a beach and I tuned into it, and I told them where this was going to be. There was a buoy uh, out there, and I said, you know. Where have you searched this? No, no, there's nothing there. We've, we've done some searches with sonar and whatever. There's nothing there. And I said, okay, well, that's, that's where he's at. So I went home with my team and I briefed them on what I knew. And I said, tomorrow, when we go to dive this thing, they're going to dive first. And after they, you know, get done with their stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll go. And so that's what happened. And then I told my guys, I want you to go to this buoy, come back about 20 yards, slightly off to the left. Bingo. That's where he's going to be. And they dropped down, made two sweeps and bingo. They had him. And the other team's like, how the hell do you do that? Well, that's tuning in. There is an actual body there and there's an attached soul. I mean, it's not technically attached to the body anymore, but the soul still wants the body recovered for the good of the family. You understand? So I'm getting information from that person who was deceased. In fact, when I went to take photos of him, it fouled my camera, the electronic cameras. And I've had that happen many times. Uh, in crime scene situations, death situations where I'm taking pictures and it fuzzes out. Even at funeral homes, I've had that happen. It's because the souls are interfering with the electrical systems and that's how it works. So are you connecting? Yeah, absolutely. You're connecting. And if you relax into it, you, you can certainly do that. So um, I see there's a couple of questions in the queue, but I, I want to um, make this a little bit um, more interactive. And I have a way that we can do this. Um, we have um, maybe approximately one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen people on this call. I'm going to put everybody in uh, breakout rooms of um, three or four people. And um, before I do that, I want you to um, do some thinking or just do a little bit of simple reflection on what you would like to, um, you know, learn in this particular. Um, you know, this particular thing that we're doing today. And I know, Joe, Jeff, I saw your, your hand, I saw your combat, and I see Rada's, Rada's got something. Um, but what I'd like to get a consensus in the group of a particular topic or something that you would like, um, Terry, to lead us to, um, you know, to figure out. And I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to put us in some rooms, and you'll have about five minutes to just talk with, with one another, and I'll give you some warning as, as to that, and then we could resume. Um, how, does that, how does that sound? I just don't want this to be like a just a good Q and A session. Is that okay? Give me a do something. Thumbs up if it's okay. Yeah, oh. thumbs up if it's okay. All right. So um, give me a Hi. second. I'm, I'm going to put you all in the breakout rooms. Sign that. And um, Radha had a very um, good. And I might if I butcher this, Radha, make sure to correct me to get it exactly right. But um, pretty much, you know, that you seem to have a very very high level of discernment. And if you could just um help us out with some like ideas of how to go about gaining a higher sense of spiritual discernment and what, what some things to look for, what some things, what areas. And let me, did I do that good enough, Rada? Uh -huh. Oh, you're on mute, Rada, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Basically what I'm saying is that I thought it would be helpful 
if you could share with us how we could develop a greater ability to discern when we're when we're when the message is coming from our true self as opposed to our ego. That that's all. Okay. Well, that one actually is a fairly straightforward question. Get that all the time. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, meditation is what people are going to tell you. Meditate, meditate, meditate to get yourself into a position where you can hear things. When I'm doing something like, let's say, uh, mediumship, let's, that's the easy one because it's clearly not going to be your voice. It's going to be a voice of, a, of someone we consider deceased. Of course, they're really not, but we consider them. If they were deceased, truly, we wouldn't be able to talk to them. But they're just uh, transitioned into spirit form. But what happens is you start to receive wording, information, that you wouldn't normally say yourself. So if you're sitting in Switzerland, as I heard, so if all of a sudden they start talking about a John Deere tractor in Nebraska, that's unlikely something you're going to be thinking about. And you're going to go, huh, wonder where that came from. It just popped in. Or there's vocabulary that's not yours. Uh, I got one uh, one time that came in in Lakota, which is Native American, and then cut with Spanish, and it came in. Well, that wasn't me. I don't speak Lakota, okay? So to get those, but I knew who it was for, and it wasn't even for anybody anywhere near me. It was for somebody over a thousand miles away from me that they knew I had a connection to and wanted me to deliver that message. And so I wrote it down, what I got. And a lot of times it comes in so fast that it's really hard to write it down. You got to tell them to slow down, slow down. I got to get this down. And so when I called the person that um, it was meant for, she goes, oh, I know exactly who that is. That's my grandmother. And here's what this flower meant. Here's what this rock meant. Here's what this Lakota meant. And she, because she was partially Lakota Indian. And so that's the easiest way I can tell you is when you get something that is not in your normal voice. It is coming from elsewhere. Now, sometimes if you're connecting with your higher self, which is clearly connected to everything else in, in the hierarchy, because you got to consider right here, this is conscious mind, right up here, subconscious mind. And above that is the superconscious mind or the mind of the universal consciousness or God in some people's mind where yours goes up, mine goes up, we meet up here. That gives me access to that if I can make my way up there too. That's how a medium does it. They go up, they go over and they go down to you and then they spit it back out to you. That's how it's done. Uh, but clearly, uh, you know, going to your higher self is part of getting into that God level consciousness because only a part of you is here. Uh, a little bit of your energy stuck in this bag of bones that we're currently inhabiting. So you will have access if you can get yourself there. One of the ways if they talk about yoga, you can get there. Meditation can get there. But one of the quickest ways, artificially anyway, that I know of is uh, using the hemi-sync system. Uh, go to the Monroe Institute, Bob Monroe, he's deceased now, but came up with the hemi-sync and you're probably very familiar with that. And mm -hmm. that's, yeah, absolutely. And so you can get right into getting both hemispheres of the brain synced. And that's what allows you to get into the higher level of consciousness. And you're gonna start to hear things that do not sound like you. And as long as those things are positive, because coming from the other side there, they're going to be positive. They're not going to be negative. Uh, they're going to be helpful in a lot of different respects. Now, people ask, can there be warnings? Well, yeah, I suppose so. You know, be cautious of this and that. Yeah, that's that can come in. And your spirit guides, angels, whichever you believe in, doesn't really matter what you label that information, will come in and they give you a warning, but it's a positive thing. Uh, they're saying, hey, you know, you're driving down a road, you need to take a left turn, left turn. You're thinking, what the hell? Why do I need to take a left turn? You're hearing it in your head, but it's not coming from you. So you take a left turn and you go around and then there's going to be a traffic crash up ahead that you find out about later on the radio or something that was a bad crash and you would have been in it. That's listening to the other sound. It's not you. It's like comes out of the blue. And yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I want to ask you a question because sure. my experience is I don't hear voices. Okay. I know things. I don't know how I know them. 
It does not come as a verbal message. That's why I know it's not my mind or my ego. Right. So for instance, the example you gave, I was once driving, I lived on Maui for 50 years and I was driving on a very, very curvy road where you cannot see, okay? And all of a sudden, I knew I had to beat my horn. I just knew it and I did. And I, there was a car coming directly at me that did not see me that would have hit me. I, and and the, something else like that happened where I just knew, okay? Mm-hmm. And I, there's no way I could ignore that knowing because it, I don't know how to explain it except it is not coming from here. I feel like it's just an encompassing knowing and I trust it, uh, you know? So, uh, and I do meditate, okay? So my, my question is, is there a way other than meditating or yoga or the way you say, and the fact that you honor it and you follow it, do you have ways to show us how to develop that capacity? Yes. It's like going to the gym. You don't become a bodybuilder overnight. It's practice, practice, and more practice. And when I work in a, um, life coach because i'm a life coach too but i also but i specifically work with people who are trying to develop themselves in a psychic manner or mediumship we have a number of exercises that we do to help tune into that and remote viewing comes into that um, in addition to um, several other aspects astral travel it's all blended very closely together and you have to slice and dice it so clearly becoming very familiar with those is one so there's books that are out there i always recommend uh to to study study and study some more it'll help you in that aspect but if you're looking for a a way to get there quicker during your meditation you all of a sudden you might meditate for when you're brand new you might meditate for four or five months and never really feel anything that feels higher but eventually there'll be a, that breakthrough process when you're ready, when your guides know you're ready and you know you're ready, you're going to have that breakthrough process. And then you're st- going to start hearing things. you got to trust what you're hearing and jot it down. And then what you do over a course of time, it you don't have to meditate near as long. And sometimes when you're really good at it, you just it's like flipping a light switch and you just turn on. And what's happening is your brain waves, which getting into the science of it you know we know you're in alpha brain waves when you're doing reiki but then there's the theta brain waves when you're doing really advanced healing so forth so learning to move your brain waves into the different patterns is really how you get connected so quickly and so you know if if i was going to read you then what i would have to do is just flip that switch say okay lights on cafe is open come on in we're going to sit and have a chat and here's who our topic is. She's sitting over here. And then let the people come through that are interested in communicating with you. You can't force them to come in uh, because a lot of people say, can you connect to so-and-so? Not really, because if I wanted to call somebody and they don't want to answer the phone, so there you go. Uh, if they want to call and there's something for you, because if I'm sitting in a restaurant, I do this with students a lot. We'll sit in a restaurant and go there for lunch and we will read the wait staff. And they won't know we're reading them at the time. We just kind of generally kind of read them. And say, what do you get on this person? I got this, this, and this. And then if we, they get them up, come over to the table, we'll say, would you mind? I got some students here that are working on, you know, their psychic abilities. Would you mind if we kind of read you and run some things by you to see if anything is correct? And so they'll say, always, they say, yeah, absolutely. That's cool. I want to do that, you know? And so then we will go ahead and give them what they, and they'll say, that's correct. That's not correct. That's correct. That's practice. And so I always say to people, you know, try to get some practice in when you can. If you're getting a claircognizant moment, meaning I'm getting an instant understanding, you know, and it's with about somebody, then check it out. Just say, hey, I'm, I'm getting this. I don't know what it means, but um, does this mean something to you? And they'll tell you, or a clear uh, v- vision, a uh, clear voice, where you get clear seeing, uh, the clear audience where you hear, which mentally, uh, I always call it kind of hearing because you are in effect getting a message and uh, you're receiving, and this is the general message you're receiving. And there's sometimes just a feeling. I feel really, you know, um, anxious or 
even if you have, you know, pains in the body where you're an empath. And then it's obviously not your pains because boom, boom, it just shows up and all of a sudden you got a headache and your shoulder hurts and you're standing by somebody you're connected to energetically. And I said, your shoulder hurt? Yeah. Do you have a headache and it's on this side of the head? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's who it is. I'm feeling it because I'm an empath, but it's not mine. And so those are some of the ways that you want to do it, but practice, practice, practice. Okay, um, I'm sort of struggling because I see there's questions and I still want to get to every group and we have like about 35 minutes. So I ask if you have a question, Romy, um, try to keep it lasered so we can go to the other groups. So Romy, you have a question? I saw your hand was up. Yes, I was uh, very much um, aligned with what Rada talked about. It's not a question, but it's just, for me, it's just the knowing. It's not after the knowing. I so many situations in my life, I think about 15 times that just felt I don't have to go to this bus when I was living in African places. I have to wait for the next. And, and in a couple of hours, we hear that this bus had a, an accident. It was burned. And usually I'm sitting in the, in the, in the further part of the car. So I would have been injured or even died because people also died. And so, and a lot of things, I, but it's just a knowing, it's not a voice, it's just, and it has to be, I have to be very clear and I have to be um, very much also relaxed and then I can go with it. And somehow I always lose it and I get it back. And sometimes very intense in between two or three weeks happen three or four things. And I would say if I once did not listen to it, I wouldn't be alive in this way as I am now. So I think it's, but, but for me now, it's just everybody has got their own sense how he gets whatever on whatever level. And during his life, we can find out what really resonates with us. And sometimes it's also with, uh, with smells or with, with sounds or whatever. Yeah. It yeah. was not that, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just chime in um, and Terry, you could speak to this, but then I want to go to group two. <laughs> you know, it's like everybody has a particular spiritual sense that they're more in touch with than others. You know, some people, in some people it's sight. You know, some people it's more touch. Some people it's more feeling. We all have individual strength in those areas. Yeah, I, I will point one that's kind of funny out. They did a special in the St. Louis News um, of a lady who worked in a uh, bakery kind of pie company. And as people walked through the door, she could taste what they wanted. And so she said, oh, you want the brownie? How do you know I want a brownie? I could taste it when you came in. Or you want the blueberry pie? I tasted it when you come in. They did a whole special on her. And that was her Claire, you know, one of the senses. And it's rare. But certainly taste is there. And sometimes smell, people will get smells like all of a sudden uh, certain smell shows up like your grandfather's pipe shows up and you know who that is. And uh, that's, that's fun when you get those. But yes, there is a primary clair generally. And then there are secondary clairs that you tend to develop. But most people develop one that rises above the other. You guys are describing clair cognizance, a clear knowing. Um, and a lot of people like that. And um, that's great. And, and everybody's going to have that. But the other ones you can develop if you, if you practice it. You certainly can. All right. So group two, what did you all come up with in terms of something you wanted to uh, discuss or get clarity on? First of all, I don't know who group two, any group, but other, what group hasn't spoken because I don't know who group two is. Go ahead, Joe Jeff. You're the, um, spokes, you're the spokesperson for whatever group we're talking about. I'll step up for my group since I botched my intro earlier. Um, so Terry kind of, Terry, you kind of got into it in terms of like, you know, conscious, unconscious, super conscious. Um, and like thinking for me with something that has been on my mind prevalent is like kind of that super conscious when you walk into a room, when you walk into a bar, when you walk into, you know, a classroom or a workplace, what's what's going on in that super conscious that people may not be privy to if they're not up there um so i was hoping you could speak to that and then also um well i'll ask more specifically if you had any experiences with feeling what's going on at you know at that level in the room you're talking then, about group consciousness group consciousness or what's yes. going on in a particular place yes. oh yeah um, absolutely um i think the the uh 
well, there's two different things. I, I will call it the living and the dead. Uh, if you kind of go into the living, there's a lot of people to read at the same time. And 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 it's kind of fun in a way that sometimes uh, so many people are, especially in an emotional situation, uh, like say a, a funeral or something like that, where people are very emotional or even a wedding. Uh, sometimes when they spill out their emotions, it's almost like marbles on the floor. You got to figure out which marble goes to who. And, and that takes a little bit. So you really have to kind of focus on one individual and then go to the next one and then go to the next one and see how that fits. Because I'm typically reading a whole room at the same time. And if I got eight people in there, or 10, I mean, I have to go and really focus on each one to gather that. But if you walk in and you're just kind of open, then you're getting all this bombardment of different ideas and concepts. So you got to really hone it down and you got to be in command. In other words, uh, you're the captain of your own ship. So you decide which way the ship goes, you decide who walks the plank, you decide where, where we're all headed to, okay? And how fast we're gonna get there. And so you just gotta tell everybody, hey, shut up. I'm talking about this person right now. Let those people come forward if there's some information I need to get. And then, okay, now I'm gonna move on to the next person. And I do it very, very quickly, but I've been doing it a long time. And for people who are just trying, just beginning, you can just start out with one person. Um, now I'm going to switch over real quickly to the dead. Let's say like I go to a haunted house, what people call haunted houses, which is kind of funny and it's a bit of a misnamer. Any, but anyway, you go in there and there's nobody there physically, but spiritually, there can be a lot of people attached to that property that think they need to be there. Typically, you know, they have some communication they want to do. Um, they're in love with earth, they're in love with the property, and uh, that connection is something that you really need to uh, walk in. And there is a relationship that you have to build almost instantaneously. And some psychic mediums will speak out loud when they go into a, um, an area like that. So they can see how many entities are there, what they want, and um, whether or not they need help to move on or if they um, just have a communication they need to give to friends or family. And uh, some just choose to stay there. I mean, you can't truly, well, there is some ways, but normally you can't force them to go anywhere. You can convince them that it's the best thing to move on through the light, but that's, that's getting into some subconscious connections to other people in the room. Uh, Joe, did he answer your question or was there any other questions from your group? Yeah, so that, that did answer my question. Uh, if I could sneak in a quick follow up, I'd really right, very quick though, because we got other people. All right, man, I'll, I'll let somebody else go. I appreciate y'all. Okay. Uh, Joe, do you have something? Joseph James? Um, really quick, I was curious can animals leave those kind of um, uh, impact like on, an, on like a room or something? Like if the, some animal was in there when they died or? Oh, sure, uh, absolutely. You know, I. I remember I was at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. I don't even live in Indiana, but I was over there and some lady was trying to tell me about tuning forks and I, I was watching her dog that was dead. <laughs> it was behind her. And I said, uh, hey, did you have a dog in a uh, black lab? Uh, looks like female. And she goes, oh my God, yeah, I did. And the dog was running behind her, staying with her. And uh, clearly animal communications is very, very possible. Residual energy from um, animals has been captured even on, on video. Uh, they had one cat, I remember, that uh, had died and they had a picture of it alive. And then uh, it was like two or three days after it died, they had a picture of it sitting on the same place it always did on the couch. So is that energy residual? Sure. Is it all part of source energy? Yes, it is. We are all part of source. We're in that entanglement uh, situation uh, scientifically. So we're all connected to one another. When they say biblically, you know, we are one, we really are one. It's just that we have these individual um, experiences and it is a bit of a, um, a game, if you will, a stage show. We are all connected, but we, when we're here, we're experiencing what it would be like to be an individual. And animals clearly come from source energy. Everything comes from source energy. So we are connected, sure. So there will be a residual energy, absolutely. Good question. So. Um... Was there uh, another group? Um, I guess I can go if I'm already uh, in the queue. Uh, I was wondering, how, how do you in life make decisions about like, um, uh, like as to when, how do you make decisions and determine like when and when not to have like a safety net? 
you know, it's like some people will say, like, if you want to pursue something, just go for it. Don't like have a plan B. And then other times you might think, oh, I should have a plan B because it'll just in case things go wrong. And sometimes I'll think of it almost in terms of uh, like if I'm practicing for a show, I'll keep practicing. And the safety net is, is I'm not performing in front of anybody else. But then the safety net goes away when I go to perform in front of somebody else. But the only way I prepare for it is I know eventually I'm going to do it with no safety net. So it's like, when do I take away the safety net? When you've mastered the topic. Mm. But let, let me add a question here that might be helpful. Um, how, how do you create a safety net for yourself going into any kind of situation? Well, some people might go the career, right? Like they'll say like, oh, well, for me, it's like, you know, I like music, but um, I think I'll say my safety net will be accounting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That happens all the time. So there's, there's, a, there's a longing to go do something else, but you still have to feed yourself. You still have to clothe yourself. You still have to have shelter over your roof over your head. You never make a transition into one thing unless you have financially and educationally prepared yourself to make that transition. So it's a slip to be safe. It's a slow transition. You still have to live in the real world. And sometimes in the woo woo world, people just make these big and they got nothing. I mean, they, they just trans I've seen it many times. They just transition to something and they didn't prepare at all. You're already talking about the right way to do it. You know, if I'm an accountant and I'm getting paid $90,000 a year and I'm going to go into stage shows, which are very um, iffy as to when your next job will be, then certainly I want to keep a foot in accounting so I can pay myself, you know, I can feed myself, take care of my family and all that stuff, but still pursue that. Once you get something steady in the next area of interest, then and you know you can make the transition. I had one guy who was getting out of law enforcement and he was getting into uh, a, another field and he called me, he goes, should I retire or not? Because he was going to retire early. And I said, can you make a living in this new field? Do you feel comfortable you can make a living? Have you been making enough money so far that you can transition and survive properly for you and your family? He goes, yes. I said, then retire. And he retired, transitioned, made a lot of money and did well. And then a little bit later, he was able to pick up his pension because he had enough time for that too. So, uh, but he made that transition because he put in the time and effort to develop the, the thing that was coming. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I guess you have to be practical about it. Well, my dad gave me good advice when I was a little kid. Uh, I was out, um, we, we do, uh, we work in the fields here <laughs> in the, the prairie state and we had to go out and uh, detassel corn. And uh, when I came back, we ended up getting in some fights because we were teenagers. And, uh, uh, you know, I ended up quitting the job because it was too many fights and, you know, it was causing problems. And he goes, so where's your next job? You just quit. Where the hell are you going to work tomorrow? You never leave a job unless you've got another one locked in. You never do that. And it was mm -hmm. good advice. And so prep, prep that future job by preparing you know, when you're making a transition in life and if it, hopefully you can find what you love and make a living at it. And in the process, prep yourself for it. You know, it's just like a doctor switching from specialty from OBGYN to psychology. He's got to go back to school or she's got to go back to school, get herself prepped and board certified, then close out your patients and move to psychology. You're still a doctor, but you're in a different field. But everybody does that. They prep for the next thing. Just like generals exiting the army, they prep for the next thing in corporate world. So good right. question. Thank you. So I don't know uh, if we finished the group thing, but I do know that when uh, Tamara started us off, um, she asked us to focus on uh, one particular thing you wanted to get out of this particular experience. You have about 20 minutes. And this is your chance to jump in uh, to ask Terry any questions or anything you want that hasn't been covered that you would like covered. Please take the time, uh, have some courage, and, and, and go for it. UFOs, Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, we got it all. Can I jump back in with a question? Sure. Um, you, you get one, and you already talked. We got a whole bunch of people that didn't talk. So you, you get your question out, but make it quick so we can get some, get some space from other people. 
All right, all right, fair enough. Um, earlier, we, we talked about different things with dreams and like archetypes. If you could speak to a little bit what it may symbolize or signify when you have reoccurring dreams and like households that you've grown up in or certain households, which may not have been yours, but another relative's. Mm -hmm. Well, they are going to represent something to you. I mean, if you have a, you keep having a dream of an old house, your grandmother's house or something like that, what does that typically, you know, knowing your history, now I would have to ask you some history, but I would just use a grandmother's house. Typically grandmothers are warm and fuzzy. You know, it's happy times to be at grandma's house. And so when you see the, the house that she lived in and you see it in a dream, man, that makes me feel good. It's a comfort level that I'm looking at. You know, that kind of stuff. And so that household reflecting back to that is something I'm yearning to do in my current life. So I'm going back to that time period to try to recapture that. And so it's my higher self telling me, hey, you need to recapture this comfort. And so you may have to change some things in your life to, to, do, the, to do that very thing. But that's, that's an example of a, of a dream and, and other people. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, who else? Hey, Chris. Hey, Terry. How you doing? I'm good. Another one from Springfield, Illinois. All right. Nobody's jumping in, so I'll jump in. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> this is a very confusing time. There's a lot going on. So um, I'm personally in a bubble right now. Everything's good in my, in my little area. Uh, however, I'm venturing out to some other areas. Let's say I want to go to, um, you know, some... Um, Neighbor, neighborhood that's crime infested or something, or a completely different part of town. Um, how can I keep myself safe energetically? Obviously, there's lots of things I could do physically, like get a martial arts training or bring Terry True Blood with me. Or, but, but how can I keep myself safe energetically? <laughs> um, you you would really have to turn yourself on at that point. If you're going in, and I'll go back to the radar, the, the third chakra information. You have to have a situational awareness. And you transition that from your physical situational awareness, which, you know, you don't go into those places first off, if you, if you can avoid it. Um, that's why people move out of those places, because they don't want to be around it. They want to relax themselves when they're at home and should be safe. Uh, but if you are going to drive through or you have a meeting and you have to be in those areas, then you really need to have your guard on. It takes a lot of energy to protect yourself. And, you, you know, not only from a physical point of view, but you're constantly scanning, you're constantly looking for exit points, you're constantly looking for places to take cover. Uh, it's almost like a police officer has to do when he walks into a restaurant. He, you, you all get to just plop down wherever you want. But you're going to see a police officer, you're going to have his back against the wall, he's going to be in the corner, he's going to be scanning everybody who comes in and this for a threat a threat for life, uh, a threat energetically and so forth. And, and so you really have to take that posture. That's why it's so exhausting to live in those places because you're constantly on guard uh, for not only physical, normally physical issues, but um, psychically uh, people are throwing out a lot of bad juju, so to speak. And you don't want to get caught by that, you know, psychic attacks and so forth. But usually a psychic attack, they have to know you. Uh, and uh, if they're spending that much time trying to figure out how to attack you, then, you know, <laughs> they've got a whole lot of life they need to live and not, not be around you. But I don't know specifically what you're asking, but. Uh, I was just trying to get the conversation started. I really didn't sure. really want to need an answer. <laughs> but um, okay. I, I don't hear a lot of um, eager, eager people wanting, wanting to ask something. I'll ask something. Thank you. How about if we talk about how to structure yourself mentally as far as handling any situation and leveling the mind constantly? Okay, yeah. Um, that's a good question, Chris, and, and one that you're pretty familiar with. So um, Chris gets to do a little ghost busting as well. So <laughs> among other things. And uh, anyway, the, the point is, and you can see his beautiful artwork in the background. If you ever want landscape ar architect or you want a beautiful picture, he's, the, he's your artist of, of superior quality. I will say that. I have one hanging in my, my living room. Um, but yeah, how do you prepare yourself? You have to know who you are. You have to know where you're at in the light. 
You cannot walk in as a victim. You cannot walk in weak. You have to walk in strong. You have to have a, a resilience within you. And you know, when you walk through the door, you know, it's kind of like the cowboy who walks through the saloon doors and he, he's the fastest gun in the West and he knocks the door down and walks in and nobody messes with him. When you walk into those situations, those energetic situations, you have to put out that air. And some people would say, look, it looked like arrogance. It's not, it's confidence. And confidence is a lot different than arrogance. Arrogance is trying to pull the information. Uh, you know, things towards you for self um, aggrandization, but uh, we're not doing that. We're just trying to put out a, an air of confidence so that anything that is in there in the unseen realm knows for, forthwith that you're lit up and you're not going to take anything from them, that you're large and in charge and you're going to master the situation immediately. Sound familiar? Absolutely. Okay. Does anybody hey, else uh, does anybody else do any ghost busting here, so to speak? I know, but Tamar's got a question. Okay, great. I have a question unless Ian, you wanted to say something. You got it, T. Okay. So two parts. Uh, okay. <laughs> the first one is um about consent. So um I was told that about reading people that you want to one see if it's okay to do, and then to ask their higher selves if you even wanna share it, right? Because uh, it is something that may or may not be good to share. Do you agree with those things? If you're gonna do a reading, a formal reading, uh, then yeah, you need the consent of someone to do it. I, I think also if it's a child, I always get the consent of the parent, one of the parents because they're underage and, you know, I'm not going to jump in. It's, it's like going through somebody's dirty underwear. You know, it's none of your business. Now, as far as just generally reading, when you're going through life, you're going to do that all the time. If you're tuned in, you're going to be constantly reading people and you may be getting data because you're just trying to make sure that everything's going okay for you. And this is a safe place to be. And in the, in the meantime, you're all of a sudden getting a, a bunch of data. Do you share it? Um, no, you don't have to share it. But if you are, get in a situation where you've broken the ice and you know, you're talking to somebody and you're getting a ton of information, well, then you can always say, you know, you, can, you don't have to tell them you're a psychic medium or anything. You just say, you know, I'm getting a strange feeling um, that, you know, does your lower back hurt you right now? You know, something like that. And they go, well, yeah, I did. I said, well, I don't know why I got that feeling. You play it off stupid, you know, that you're you just, you know, you're getting some, you're unaware. Now, clearly you're very aware if you're advanced, but you don't want to scare somebody or anything like that. And, and then if they say, yeah, well, how'd you get that? I, I don't know. I just kind of came in, you know, and, and then you can start the conversation thinking, wow, you get anything else? Then they're giving you consent right there. If not, you know, you, you've, you've given uh, across the information that you may get. I had, I had one, I remember they kept saying, I was in a church actually, and they kept saying to this, there was an associate minister sitting way back in there and they, they kept, I mean, it was literally, tell her, tell her, tell her, tell her, tell her like this, you know, so finally, um, I stood up and I, I said, this is for so-and-so in the back. She goes, for me? And I said, yep. And I said, you apparently have asked for a closer connection to God. They're showing me that Michelangelo picture of the finger of God touching the finger of man. And I said, what you have asked for will be granted. And then I sat back down. She knew exactly what I was talking about. She knew, and I didn't. But I just kept getting told, tell her, tell her. It was in a situation where I knew because she gives readings herself that she would appreciate that. No, I wouldn't just walk into any old place and just start giving somebody a reading. So good, great question. Great question. So you got to kind of schmooze your way into it if you really want to do that and make sure people understand it. But you're constantly going to be reading people. You're not trying to, but if you get really good at it, it's just coming all the time. And you just got to shut it off and walk on unless it's really, really important. Like some of these folks were talking about precognition. And I remember one of my family members got a precog set. She's a precog, but she said, I know there is a, a, a airplane crash that's going to happen today. And so she called me and I said, well, 
what do you want me to do about it? And so she goes, well, you're in law enforcement. Don't you have somebody you can call? I said, they will lock my ass up <laughs> if I call and say there's going to be a crash because they'll think I had something to do with it. And I said, that's the sad part about precognition, unless it's related to you or somebody very, very close to you, there's nothing to do with it. You know, nobody's going to believe you. it's kind of Nostradamus, you know, now hundreds of years later, it's coming true, supposedly. Um, but there was a crash that night. And uh, I know the city it was in was a large American city. Uh, nobody got hurt, but it, it, there was a crash on an airport. And, uh, but she was concerned because one of her family members was flying that night. And I said, it's got nothing to do with them. They're going to be perfectly fine. I just helped her with that. And then, you know, but what, a, you know, sometimes people call this um, a gift. Other people, they call it, you know, a, a curse. Because if you're getting big precog, who do you tell? <laughs> There's nobody to tell. And, and it's really kind of challenging. So, so you have two parts, two, two parts of that question. Oh, is there Tomorrow, do, you have, do you have two parts? Two parts. Yeah, the other part was, do you? She, she do you, froze. She froze. Yeah, the first part was, do you um, uh, get consent? Yeah, and I think the second part, whatever it was, I don't remember at this point. I thought we covered both of them, but is, is there a reason why you would get uh, some type of message where you there was nothing you could do about it? Yeah, you're tuned in. You're tuned into what's happening. Um, you can make note of those things. Some people who they've even written books about it and they start to put things down. And I, I get those. I certainly do. But I write them down. And so I have a log of all that stuff. So as things start to come true, you can you can help. It helps you decipher what information you're getting. I mean, look at the Bible. The Bible had a lot of precognition in it. Um, the 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 various. Uh, uh, you know, prophets and so forth that were, you know, listed in the Bible, they precogged a whole lot, and some of it's still coming true. So, you know, if something's going to be 5,000 years in the future, and you're the first written prophet, you, <laughs> how many people are going to believe you? I mean, they're really probably not, but you write it down anyway. So, yeah, there's not much you can do about it other than it just says you're tuned in and you're listening to a higher authority and how things are going to lay out for, in that particular case, for mankind. Mm. So some are some are individual messages, some are regional messages, some are worldwide messages, and some are future worldwide messages. And um, you know, you learn to discern those into categories. And some are just supportive messages, other ones are take action type messages. And you'll have to each message will have its own particular content, and you'll have to decide what you're going to do with that uh, based upon what you're what you're gaining, what you're receiving. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm just wondering if anybody else that hasn't spoken would like to ask Terry a question or, um, or not. Tomorrow, you got your hand up. Yes, thank you. I uh, lost connection. I, I really appreciate the response, Terry. Um, to my first question, my second question was. Um, let me get rid of this. There you go. Um, do you find so I've sort of noticed and I've been advised by some people about this that doing this kind of work sometimes can take a toll on the physical body. And um, maybe you can speak to that and how to stay safe in that way because I've seen this pattern of people channeling and then having these issues. Uh, one, one thing I've heard is is not to bring in things inside. Uh, maybe you can speak to that. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it, the, there's a <clears throat> concept of good versus evil that's out there, you know. And is 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 and if you are constantly doing readings, does that does that screw you up in any way, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, whatever? Um, it could. And in fact, I was dealing with one particular uh, psychic medium who's exceptionally good. And as I was, uh, I got this information for her before we even had a phone conversation. I mean, we, we know each other, but I finally contacted her and I said, listen, you are not supposed to be doing as many readings as you are. I got it very clearly. You're supposed to do three readings a day. 
because you'd be doing hour long sessions, three readings a day, and you could do four if it was what you considered an emergency or a special, you know, deal for a friend or something like that. But you have to back off because you're wearing yourself out energetically. And, and then what I also find that people doing too many readings that they're, they get into a rhythm and the quality drops off. And so I could have you call and get the same thing that I'm getting and have Chris call and he's going to get the very same reading. And this is somebody who's overdone it. They're, they're literally at the point where they're pumping out so many readings that it's just routine. And, and there may be a few individualized things in there, but the bulk of it's just rote memory. And that's really challenging. So they need to take a breath, take a break and reconnect to the rest of life. Don't live in the spiritual thing. I, I was telling like water skis. If you've ever been water skiing and you got two skis on, um, you're, you're a spiritual thing, but you're also a physical thing. So you need to lean one way into the physical, lean the other way into spiritual, but try to stay in a balance so that you're not going too far one way or too far the other. And find that balance, give the readings that feel comfortable to you. And if you're not getting the data across that's valid, um, that's a real problem. And I'll just jump in and also say, as it relates to readings, I want you to all understand that if we have three or four psychics sitting here and they're all going to read tomorrow, okay, we may give different readings because we're using our own clip art to try to get to the same information. And so I may say it in a certain way, the next person may say it in a different way and a different way. And I would expect that, that should be normal. But ultimately is the summary of what you're getting the same. If so, chances are that that message is solid. And uh, you know, some people are, uh, let's say Buddhist. So they may give you a Buddhist flavor to the reading. Another person's Christian, they'll give you a Christian flavor. Another one's Jewish and they give you a Jewish flavor. And another one's Hindu, they give you a Hindu flavor. Okay, but they're all basically saying the same. It's like reading uh, sacred texts. If you look at the um, golden rule, the golden rule, and you can pull out five different religions, of course, there's 12 major ones, but five different religions that's come to mind, and you could read the golden rule, and they're virtually the same. And I've actually done this in class, and I wrote all five out, and I said, match it to the religion, and nobody can do it because they're so close, they have no, no idea. But it's the same data, just coming from a slightly different source. Yeah, or no, it's the source yeah, of the same, so it's different, yeah. different. Every, every psychic has a distortion. All of us are distorted. So when it comes through, it distorts through our understanding of life. And even though they're trying their very best to be clean, if you can get a psychic to the 70 percentile, you're really doing well. And I've seen some psychics that are at the 90 percentile in my book. And so they're really as clear as they possibly can be. But there is a distortion because you grew up female. That's a distortion. You know, you grew up in a certain country. That's a distortion. You grew up a certain religion. That's a distortion. Can you start to set that aside as much as you can? Yes. But there's still those distortions. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean the information is incorrect. It just means it's slightly distorted as it comes through. So everybody needs to keep that in mind as they go from person to person. And some just don't link up to you very well. And you, a good ethical uh, reader should say, man, we're just not connecting today. So I'm going to give you your money back or let's just reschedule for next Friday and see if everything works. Not, if not, I'm going to give you your money back. And there's where a problem comes in when they just rip you off. And that's a real issue. Okay. We're, we're about a time here. Um, I want to give people uh, Terry's email address. I think it's, was it Mr. What's your email address, Terry? Uh, mystical doc, D O C at gmail.com. I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, and then Ian, you wanted to um, give us a, a little something, you wanted to do something? Uh, yeah, well, first um, I wanna thank everybody who joined us. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And Terry, thank you so much for leading us. I know I got a lot out of this. Uh, took us a second to maybe get on path, but I think it was really wonderful. And I'm already excited to kind of watch it again and kind of pick through and dive a little bit deeper. Um, but real quick, I just wanted to talk about the Sacred Inclusion Network. This is why we're all here. I am the assist, assistant director, and we pretty much, we have a few in right now, uh, in this chat, excuse me. But if, everyone, if anyone's interested, uh, we pretty much have four avenues of engagement. One being these explorations that we just experienced, where we try to reach out to interesting, phenomenal people who have metaphysical or spiritual backgrounds. And, 
lead these explorations that we can all give and take and share and learn. Uh, the second avenue is what we call our mastermind groups, where we get a group of maybe four to eight people and each, it's a bi-weekly thing. Every other week, a different person is spotlighted and then they can bring um, what has been maybe on their mind to the table and we can all discuss it. And it could be anything from a creative idea to deep, you know, family Trump traumatic healing. Um, we just want to create a, a sacred community where we feel comfortable talking. I know uh, one of the members brought up talking about transition from the normal job, the accounting job to potentially reaching out their, their dreams. And that's something that in these mastermind groups, we can talk more detail in each specific, we can go, we can dive into each specific um, I can't think of the word, but I think you get me. Uh, the second one, the third one, excuse me, we have our accountability sessions where we pretty much get on a Zoom call for an hour, hour and a half, and we all separately but together work on our passion projects. We just dive in, whether it's writing a book, editing your book, making beats, drumming, whatever you're passionate about, it's your opportunity to be accountable to yourself, and we try to provide accountability for each other. And the fourth avenue is we have an online network which is kind of our little um, social media type thing where we can just continue these conversations and we have questions and content. And um, it's a great place to like, you know, if anybody kind of thinks of something now, like, oh, I didn't get to ask it. That's when we can follow up. And there's all sorts of interesting things on the site. So um, if anybody is, um, is interested, uh, you can one, put your email in the chat right now, or you can follow up um, 